When you're writing code for a new feature that interacts with the database, it's easy to fall into the trap of not really thinking about the volume of data that that code's going to interact with, especially over time in production. In your local development environment, you really don't have that much data, but that will change in production. So here are things you need to be thinking about early on when you're writing these code to keep your queries performant, as well as understanding that over time, that will change. It's a little bit of illusion when you're in your local development environment, when you're interacting with your database for some new feature where you really don't even have much data at all. So all the queries that you're performing, while they may be simple, where they're just selecting, say, a subset of data, it really doesn't seem like that much of an issue. Queries are fast. You think you have good indexes. We'll touch on that more. But it's just once you actually get this application out in production, and it's out there for years and years and years, Data is growing. What you thought what looked fine in your development environment when you're testing, developing, isn't going to be the same thing and have the same type of performance in production with a lot more data. Before I jump into the first tip and things you should be thinking about related to your schema and how you're writing queries, I'd like to thank Event Store for sponsoring this video. Event Store DB is a new category of operational database built for event sourcing, CQRS, and event driven microservices. For more on Event Store DB, Check out the link in the description. No matter what type of database you're using, when you're writing a query from some new feature, you want to be realizing that you don't want that to be unbound. You want to have some bounds. That could be date ranges. It could just have some, some limit on the query of the number of records it's going to return, pagination, etc. But thinking about the query that you're actually writing, whether it be between some type of date range with some limits, there's a lot of things depending on the database that you're using that at least you can form some type of bounds. So it just can't be unbound where, okay, in my local environment, it's great, it's fine, I only have 10 records. But then in production over years and years and years, you have hundreds of thousands. And you don't really necessarily know when you're writing that, that that actually might be the case. So the first tip really is thinking about no matter what query you're writing, you don't want it to be unbound. You wanna be thinking about, okay, maybe in 10 years from now, what's the data set actually look like? What are the number of records that would actually be possibly returned from the query that I'm writing here? If it's gonna return a thousand, that probably isn't the answer. So think about every query you're writing, how you can have some type of bounds that's gonna limit the number of records that are suitable for the actual feature that you're writing. Tip number two is really thinking about data partitioning. This doesn't alleviate tip number one, you still wanna be making sure that your queries aren't unbound, but the idea of data partitioning, there's a lot of examples you can probably think with in your own system where you can partition data that's something really revolves around the life cycle. In my example here, it could be just be time bound, maybe by calendar year, but there's probably a lot of examples you can think about in your own data where there's really hot data usually, where it's kind of current data that you're working with and that's really what's getting queried. And you can really almost kind of archive data separately to a different store, to a different table, collection, whatever the case may be but just really thinking about uh, as a means to do this of data partitioning. Tip number three is really just optimizing the structure and the data that you persist for queries. It's always kind of amusing that we often structure data for writes when most systems are actually more read intensive than they are write intensive. Regardless, just having queries that can be performed over structured data that's more optimized for them. That mean could be creating a uh, materialized view. So we could have a separate table that we're actually doing our query on if we needed the total so that we can do these pre-computations, store the total rather than doing it in line in our actual query. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have separate tables as my example. You could just be using the existing structure that you have and separately for recording totals so that you can actually uh, query on them, you can have conditions on them, etc. They're there. And if you've watched any of my videos on event sourcing and CQRS, you can see how this plays a part. Is that sure, we may be event sourcing and we have an event store that we're persisting our events to our event streams, but we may not want to use that for query side. Rather, that's where CQRS comes in, is that we can then have projections that we're using these events from our event store, from our event stream, and we're really changing the shape, the structure of what this looks like to be more optimized on how we wanna read and how we wanna query. So we can persist that in a separate database, a separate schema that's completely optimized for the query side. So that is kind of the method of CQRS involving with event sourcing is we're taking our event stream, these events, we're kind of the changing the shape of what that looks like that's gonna be optimized for queries. I'll have links to two videos related to materialized views and projections at the end of this video. I think there's this general idea of people kind of seem to be extracted from the database a little bit here, so that when you're creating your database schema, you, maybe you define some indexes and that's the end of it. 
But that's really not the case at all. It's as time goes on, as data grows, the indexes that you actually need are gonna change. The really, all your indexes are based off the statistics and the data. So understanding that as data grows, that's gonna change. On your local machine, if you have the exact same indexes that are in production, based on the statistics of the data, you're not necessarily gonna have or use the same indexes based on the same query. So it's this constant evolution is as data grows, realize that the queries that are being performed in your production environment and are the indexes still suitable based on that. So it's this constant needing to monitor it, needing to realize these queries that are being performed and do the indexes need to be changed? Do you have to have some indexes that are removed, some that are added with different multi-columns? Maybe you have some functional indexes. There's a lot of ways to deal with this, but the idea is it's an evolution, it's gonna change. It's not that you just define them at the very beginning when you define the schema and that's it. You gotta pay attention to it over time. Another thing to consider is just the life cycle of the data that you're working with. In any type of system, there's oftentimes some finite life cycle where you're creating data, you're creating those records in your database, some state that's changing potentially with it, and then after it's done, it's done. There's really not changing any data, and really at that point you can think about archiving it. You can really think of this as an example of, let's say, some type of support ticket system where tickets open, that's some creation of that data, then it goes through some state changes where then it's pending, it's resolved, and then it's closed. And after it's closed for a period of time, you're not likely to ever really change or mutate that data. And why this matters is it can help when you're thinking about earlier about partitioning, indexes, bounds, and even event sourcing. Because the idea of your event streams, sure you're appending events, but you want those event streams to be relatively small. They're gonna be finite generally. And if you have to, then you may use something like snapshotting. But the general idea here is just generally thinking about there are often life cycles. And if you're gonna have a system that lasts a very long time, think about what those life cycles are for the business processes, the entities, those workflows, because they are generally finite. So when you're writing some new code for that feature and you need to write some query to your database, be thinking about these things, about having some type of bounds, because right now, sure, there's not a lot of records, but there may be in the future. So thinking about the bounds of that query, but maybe as well as data partitioning. There's a lot of cases in different domains where there's just kind of natural partitions. Explore that, see where that may fit in your system if you can partition by different sets of data, by year, some time bounds, etc. Also be thinking about realizing that the indexes you create now based off the limited data now is gonna change the execution plans and the indexes that are used potentially over time as that data grows. It's not just define indexes and that's the end of it. Also, lastly, kind of thinking about the life cycle of data, which can help to all of these things about partitioning, about the bounds, and trying to keep the idea of what a life cycle is for an entity, for a workflow, and how that may be stored differently. And as well as thinking about whether you're event sourcing or not, about materialized views and just optimizing how you can query your data and getting it in a shape and a schema that's just really beneficial for querying. I said earlier, there's a lot of times where we kind of create schemas building around how we want to perform writes, when in reality, most of our systems are read intensive, not write intensive. I wanna thank all the members of my channel and everybody on Discord for growing that community. If you wanna join, check the link in the description. You can get access to a private Discord server where you can chat with other software developers about software architecture and design. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any other thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment and please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.